Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Leviticus chapters 3 and 4. And in chapter 3, we continue looking at these different offerings that the people of Israel had to give during the Mosaic Covenant times. And in chapter 3, 1 through 17, we see the instruction about the peace offerings. Now, this would be an occasional offering. Chapter 7 is going to explain a little bit of that. Uh, it was another animal sacrifice, but notice that only certain parts are burned, and even that depended on whether the sacrifice was from the herd or flock, depending on what kind of animal was being given. And the reason only certain parts were to be burned was because the peace offering included a feast for the worshipers, and all of it was to remember the peaceful relationship that Israel had with God. Chapter 4, that whole chapter, is an instruction on sin offerings. And this is more of a purification offering because this would be accomplished whenever there was uncleanness on the part of the people to purify them before they came to the Lord in worship. Now, this wasn't happening every morning, evening, and at certain times, but it would have been a very frequent offering because, of course, no man is without sin and the uncleanness that was part of that Mosaic covenant to stay away from, to keep away from, would have been much more frequent as well. And that means that it would have necessitated more sin offerings being provided. The sacrifice is given on the part of whoever sinned against the Lord, whether it was a, a leader leading the whole congregation into sin or, or a leader just sinning in and of himself uh, or the people sinning. Anytime that it was, as soon as it was made known that they were in sin, they had to present this sacrifice. And it was an animal sacrifice because a life had to be given in place of the life of the sinner. There's a consequence to sin, and it had to be felt by the sinner in the form of this sacrifice. Some principles from these two chapters that we learn. Well, God has always been more interested in the heart of the one who gives sacrifice, who offers something to the Lord. The Lord cares about our worship, not rote actions of sacrifice or offering. And we actually see that. Uh, of course, in the instance where Samuel uh, tells Saul in 1 Samuel 15 that he was to obey the Lord and not try and whip up some excuse for disobedience by bringing sacrifices into play. But in Psalm 46 through 8, we actually have what was most likely a, uh, a very neat saying that wouldn't have been wrote, but at least the attitude is being presented here on the behalf of a worshiper of the Lord who is preparing such a sacrifice. And let's look at Psalm 46 through 8. Sacrifice and meal offering you, that would be God, have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. And then I said, Behold, I come, and the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. See, there is why. The burnt offerings and sin offerings would not be required because God's law would be on the heart of the person that's speaking here. It's about the worship of the heart. That's really what the Lord is after. He's always after that. And he was even during these Mosaic covenant times. And we see this, in, even though it sounds very ritualistic and, and there was a lot of ritual involved, the people were supposed to be doing this out of a desire to be purified and to be considered holy before the Lord so that they could worship him rightly. That, of course, has to be happening on the inside, doesn't it? And we're going to see that in Deuteronomy. God's going to really throw that at the people, telling them that they need their hearts circumcised and then revealing that he's going to be the one to do it. We also see in these two chapters that God has uh, provided uh, peace, doesn't he? He provides a, a way of there being peace between those who were at war with him because of their sin and himself. He provides peace peace between the two. And, and that peace today is provided in his son, Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 21 through 22 says, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. This is Jesus Christ did this in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. This is why we don't engage in animal sacrifices and these grain offerings and these sin offerings and all of these offerings that are given here, peace offerings, because it's actually been offered already on behalf of us by the Lord. And now what's to remain is that we would come before him in worship. And that's another thing that we learned from these two chapters is that approaching the Lord in worship is a serious matter. Because he's holy and just, and he responds to sin with death and destruction, with wrath. So there should be a great respect in our hearts when we come before the Lord in worship, 
whether privately or as a congregation. I'm not saying that God is standing back, pointing a, an accusing finger at us. If we indeed are in Christ, then he's, he's got his arms opened up. He wants us to run to him. And yet at the same time, it's a serious matter, and we should think of it seriously. Every time we see somebody coming in the presence of God in the Bible, they fall down like dead men, or they come away just, just shining. Uh, there's this seriousness to it. And we need to be serious as well. And remember, Moses, uh, on top of that mountain, even he could not actually go in the presence of God in the tabernacle because God is so holy. He only could see a passing glory in, of God, and that was the, the that, that shining that appeared on his face afterward. Going before the Lord in worship is a serious matter, whether that's privately through our, our devotions, through our prayer life, as we just praise God, or, or whether it's publicly with our family or or perhaps in the church as well. We need to be more serious as we approach the Lord. We also see from these principles that the Lord is ready to forgive. He gives a, a whole uh, sin offerings to the, the people for them to give so that he can forgive them. He's ready to forgive if we'll just run to him his way. Now, of course, in the church today, there are things that we offer. We offer our time. We offer funds that the Lord has given us. We, we, we do that to the Lord, don't we? We offer our attention to him, our worship, our praise. And so it is important that we consider our offerings in the church. They look very different from the Levitical ones here, but it is important to remember the principle behind it. Let's not give to the Lord uh, some offering of time or effort or money or whatever. Let's not give with the motive to try and earn his favor or even to try and remain in his favor because you can't do that. That's God's grace that brings us to his favor and then keeps us in his favor. Rather, let's give whatever we're giving. Let's give to the Lord out of a desire to worship him, to please him, yes, but to please him out of love for him and out of fear, that respect for God as well. And we also see here very clearly in Leviticus 4, the people were to keep a short account before the Lord, weren't they? As it says, as soon as they were made aware of their sin, they were to bring a sin offering. And that principle still holds true. We must keep a short account with the Lord as well. As soon as we recognize that we're in sin, whether because someone has confronted us over our sin, whether they did it lovingly or not, if they've confronted us and we are in sin, yes, we need to repent. We need to confess that sin to the Lord. Maybe it's just that the Lord moves our thoughts to understand that we're in sin. As we're reading scripture, just contemplating our day, we must immediately go to the Lord without delay, confess our sin, and repent, which means forsaking our sin, not just confessing it and then coming back and doing the same sin over and over and over again. We must truly repent. And, and just listen to how loving the Lord is, how ready he is to forgive. 1 John 1, 8 through 9, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. What precious news. And if you have not done that yet, if you've not confessed your sins to the Lord and, and trusted in Jesus for salvation to be cleansed from all unrighteousness, this holds true. Turn to Christ. Trust in him for salvation. Don't delay. And, and if you're a Christian and you're living in known sin, stop right now and confess that sin and repent from it. God's ready to forgive. He's ready to cleanse you from that unrighteousness, that daily practical unrighteousness. And make you holy daily, more and more like Jesus, so that we can really bring glory to God with our living and proclaim his gospel without being hypocritical as well. Well, this has been our daily Bible reading today, Leviticus chapters 3 and 4, and I hope you have a great day.